Half a year later, Cameron finally starts to feel as if he's starting to live life again. Hmm. Not his old life, but a new unfamiliar one. Tapering down his meds along with exercising definitely helped. Which is why he came here with Devin to visit Arturo. When he sees his old friend, he feels a bit better, just based on the shape of his amalgamation. It's a bit more full, and while it's still damaged, it's also at peace. Cameron knows that feeling. He's different now, and he's accepted that. But he's still Arturo, which the cat has come to accept too. He's just different now. Changed. Like everyone changes. A terrible dramatic change, but one that can happen to anyone. Things always tend to get worse, but then they tend to get better too. And Cameron knows this just by looking at Arturo. While the coyote did just want to see his old friend, he also wanted to know a few other things. His methods are morally questionable, but he justifies it since he's tired of being kept in the dark. An hour before they get there, Cameron eats a piece of chocolate from the backpack he, he brought for their stay at a motel. Devin complains when Cameron says that it was the last one, but the coyote knows that the bear would lose his mind if he knew what exactly Cameron did. Oh gosh! Oh yep. no! His oh power, no! His powers get better when he's on illicit substances! No! Oh gosh! No! That it was microdosing psilocybin! Oh no, Cameron! Gosh! You're doing so good! Stupid, idiotic, unbelievable, what it could cause him severe, lasting damage. So that's the voice. Mm -hmm. It's a Yusef. Idiot. It might have been what triggered a schizophrenia, but... His abilities increased tenfold, even on this tiny amount. Gosh. Besides, it made him feel better. Of course, he'll tell Devin when more time has passed, but the bear has shown almost zero interest in the paranormal as of late. Maybe he'll just tell him he's taking it for the mood lift. No, Cameron. Mm. For now, he just wants to take in the emotions and conversation. Hey, Matt, guess what? You got your character. You get lines! Yes, my boy's alive! <laughs> Yay! Is that That's Maslow's cool. hierarchy that he's wearing on his shirt? Yes. <laughs> it's Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I have it needs. says, I have needs. It's <laughs> 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 funny, because, Arturo, you know, he does. <laughs> Arturo was a psychology major, don't forget that, guys. <laughs> Well, what, what I'm trying to do is get rid of this damn lip. That's what people no, notice m most if I'm not talking. <laughs> Cameron smiles pleasantly, despite the fact that Arturo is more guarded and fortified mentally than anyone else he's met, which is the last thing he'd expected. Although, dude, he was shot in the head. <laughs> Well, no, no, he's talking about from, like, the psychic end of things. Like, he wasn't expecting to uh, be defending his brain right now. Okay, I see. Okay. I just put a scratch. Ah, uh, well, you will next time you see me walk. Anyway, I hear you're waiting on your m master's, Devin? Every stutter, every struggle feels like a physical blow to Cameron, but he tries not to show it. He knows Artie doesn't want useless pity right now, and Cameron always hated it too. 
Uh, yep. Up at the University of... Desiree. Desiree. I was going to say, that's, that's not University of Dessert, so... It's either Desiree <laughs> or Desiree, depending on like whether that T is silent or not. Could be Desert Day. No. Sweet! And what? Mechatronics or... Robotics. Of course! And how's that, uh, you know... How's that progressing? Good. Just finished my first semester. And the place you're working at? They're financing that? That's really qu qu quick. I'm at the same company. I was always part of the plan once we moved. I still gotta graduate for them to reimburse my tuition, though. No pressure? I don't know how he does it all. Work, school, cooking, gaming. And you're good at all of it. That's just like him. He party and drink the night before a final and then ace it while hungover. <laughs> My roommate was like that. He was on the freaking dean's list and he was high every day. And I was like, ow! <laughs> Good dude. <laughs> I miss him, actually. <laughs> I want to meet up with him in sword fight again. <laughs> he'd get stupid high and then be like, dude, do you want a boss? And then he'd beat the shit out of me. High <laughs> off his ass. And I was like, oh, no. I, I actually remember when I used to have, like, nerf swords and everything. I loved playing, like, stupid, like, little sword battles with my dad. Yep. <laughs> yeah, same. <laughs> Cameron is close enough to Devin to see the skin flush under his fur. While some might find Devin to be overly humble, it has more to do with the sort of imposter syndrome. That's us. Cameron, kn Cameron knows it must be awkward to be praised for not having to study or work as hard as his fellow students and co-workers. Oh, you know what? Matt's right. Artie's right. Devin's sus. He's the he's the imposter. Get his ass out of here. I immediately agree with Alan. <laughs> that means PJ. Yeah, I love how we're referencing something that nobody else gets. Quit vote, they, they De they quit vote Devin off. <laughs> no, DJ, he 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 latched on too quick. <laughs> Despite that, Cameron still feels proud knowing his boyfriend is already inching into a leadership position at the company. He has no doubt the bear will be doing incredible things in his career. So, how are things going for you? What are you doing these days? Are you thinking about going back to work at that specialized school? Yep, Spectrum Solutions Academy, and I'm already back. Oh, went, 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 back as soon, went back as soon as I got vaccinated. Still an RBT, working with kids with with lo, low functioning autism. How is it? Great. It was almost like going back home. I'm supposed to have like two clients, but they've got about five on me now. <laughs> you know, I'm willing to bet if we talked with Sam about this, he'd be like, "Those sons of bitches overwork Gardy." <laughs> no, he'd, he'd be like, "Wait," they'd be like, "Wait, only five? How did he? Who did he kill?" <laughs> I don't say that. <laughs> they were so happy to see me. You can tell something's a bit off about me, though. Sounds a bit rough. Is your recovery still going well? Artie visibly draws into himself a bit. I like to call it a process these days. Most of the recovery is over, I think. Oh, I see. It's silent for just a second too long. 
Cameron's slow response is mainly due to being distracted, having finally deciphered Artie's general thoughts, feelings, and emotions. At that moment, that guard had slipped, and Cameron realizes Artie knows he's psychic. Of course, he told him that, but now he knows it, truly believes it, and for the past almost two years, He'd realized how much of this happened because of Cameron. Arturo was afraid of Cameron. The cat senses the strangeness, the offness of who Cameron is now. Arturo also wonders if it's possible that the coyote brought a piece of echo into the house with him. That shadow entity. It entered him and never came back out, as far as Arturo knows. Who's to say it's not still? Maybe it's like a management phase. That's what Cam calls it. Anyway, that's what Cam calls it anyway. R right, honey? Devin, probably confused by the tension, tries to add more to the conversation. That's right. That piece of shit hurt you pretty badly too, huh? Yeah, really it's a schizophrenia I was diagnosed with afterwards that I'm still trying to manage. Cameron suddenly decides to just tell Arturo about his own struggles, if only to look for some sympathy, understanding. It seems unfair not to tell him, for some reason anyway. For a moment, Arturo's expression becomes one of genuine sadness. Oh, I'm really, really sorry to hear that, Cameron. Was it from what happened? I hope it wasn't the weed. No, I think it's what happened after that that pushed me over the edge. I see. That makes sense. Do you think it would have happened anyway, eventually? Cameron shrugs. Maybe? I uh, think I might have been in a prodromal state for years. It's obvious that I was on the brink for a while. So yeah, remember how I mentioned one of the builds was called prodrome? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, they've been hinting that this was the ending for since build 4, at the very least, if not earlier. Oh boy. But he'll never know. For that moment, though, he feels like he and Artie have made a connection. Artie understands that they have completely different problems, but they're both life-changing, and the two of them are bound to these problems for the remainder of their lives. But then Artie senses that darkness, that bit of echo emanate from Cameron again and he mentally recoils. It's been a rough road. We managed to find some stability at the end of last year. It's such a pain in the ass trying to settle on the right meds. That took Maria a few years, I think. I... Th hmm. Hey, Maria! There's some rustling from the hallway, and a young leopard comes into the living room. Maria, having been very nearby in the hall. Wait, okay. Why'd you go? So, now we have Maria. I'd like to just mention, this is the first and only female character that gets lines in this entire game. <laughs> Amazing. But I mean, it makes sense. Like, <clears throat> it's, this is not really a game that had a, lo a large cast or anything. Mm-hmm. I do think, though, um, if we ever did this with, like, the full group, Maria probably would just be voiced by, like, Sam or Morgan or whoever was there at the time. For now, though, because you have so many lines, Hannah, I want to know, do you want to be Maria or do you want Seb or uh, Fane to be Maria instead? Um, I guess I could go either way. What would um, you prefer? Because there's still a little bit left of the game, so we'll probably be going for, like, another hour still. Okay. Oh, boy. If it's that much longer, then yeah, maybe have somebody else pick it up. All right. 
Seb, Fane, which one of you wants to be Maria? Sure, I'll take it. Might as well. Okay. <clears throat> My mic's good? <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah, you're good. Right. Just wanted to give you guys some space. We were just talking about how long it can take to adjust to meds. Maybe you can give us some advice again? Oh my god, that's an oral pick. Oh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She leans... <laughs> she leans in to give Arturo a kiss. And Arturo takes it without a single hint of embarrassment or annoyance. Genuinely, I love Artie and Maria. Like, Arturo, like, before he got shot, like, you remember when he's, like, trying to get out of town? He, like, is flashing back through his own memories of his life, and he's like, I have to get back to Maria. I said I would support and protect her until I died. Aww. Like, mm -hmm. she was the good thing that convinced him to grow up and become, like, a better person. And then he has brain damage and is, like, struggling to recover. But Maria is like, no, now it's my time to support you. Mm. And I'm like, yes, this is such a cute couple. I adore them. Take no chase, Leo. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of rocks... <laughs> Another solid rock in Artie's life. And what? <laughs> I told you, speaking of rocks. <laughs> and one that will stay until the end. While Cameron would normally never invade someone's mind like this, the coyote doubts he'll have many chances to do so again in the future. And he needs to know if Artie's on a good track or not. Maria turns to Cameron, and because they themselves have been friends for years, even a little longer than he's known Devin, he can tell that this is weirdly set up. Oh yeah? Antidepressants, antipsychotics, mood stabilizers. It feels like I've I've been through almost all of them. Yeah, it makes me want to sleep all day. It also tear out my fur and crawl out my skin. Cameron likes Maria a lot, and just like Devin and Arturo, they slip back into the old swing of things. It's nice, but he can't help but notice how he's been swept out of the conversation with Arturo. Anyway, the main reason I went back to work this early is because I need something normal. Sure, things are hard now. It's stuttering memory shit. Can't really depend on the right side of my body anymore. But fuck. Is it nice not being cooped up in here living on disability? The only thing but the only thing work has complained about is that I guess my inhibitions are a bit lower than they used to be. I swear, I'm not trying to be a dick, but I haven't even noticed that. Oh yeah? They said something about too many words to do a little tech, like three years ago. So, I'm pretty sure it's just me. <laughs> I can kind of tell that it might might be affecting you now, but sometimes it's hard to tell if the side effects from symptoms of psychosis... From, from symptoms of psychosis, especially the residual negative symptoms. I mean, positive symptoms are obvious, but making your thoughts flow normally again? Making yourself want to go back outside, talk to normal people, to people, live? That tends to come back last, and sometimes it comes back a bit different. Sometimes doesn't come back at all. Now, while he tries to hold a conversation about psychotropic medications with Maria, he realizes how much things have changed. In fact, if Cameron's visions hold true, this will be one of the last of the handful times we'll speak to Artie. 
it hurts. It leaves Cameron feeling a deep pit of guilt, shame, and even a little anger, but mostly because it's unfair and he can't blame anyone. But as he watches his old friend laugh and talk to death, almost like what happened never happened, Cameron sees a long, solid friendship ahead of them, and he's happy for that. Cameron realizes, even without having to read minds, that Maria is specifically there to keep Cameron distracted, to keep him away from Arturo. That finally shuts up the psychic part of Cameron's brain. Rather than leaving a hollow feeling, he's left feeling like he's been punched. Why are they treating him like a monster? Like he's the one. The final thought he receives is from Maria, and deep down, under her concern for Cameron's diagnosis, she's wondering if he's prodding at Arturo's mind. Arturo can sense him. His own sensitivity is subtle, almost too understated to be picked up on, but it's there. And that's why he feels like Cameron is carrying Echo with him. Cameron is mainly worried that Arturo knows what he's doing right now. And his neck and cheeks become warm as he feels like he's been caught in the act. Maria mentions something about how she has tardive dyskinesia. And Cameron focuses back on their conversation, genuinely curious that if it's gotten better for her with time. And that's how the rest of the afternoon plays out. The reason he'll only see Arturo two or three more times in his life isn't because of Arturo or Maria. It's because Cameron knows he can't come back here and cause them stress like this. Cameron is no longer a part of or welcome in their lives, and he won't impose himself again. Despite the hurt from learning their true feelings about him, Arturo's future is, if he has to sum it up, a happy one. Okay, here we go. Here's the final scene. March of 2023, three years later. Time continues on in its steady, unrelenting march, and it brings with it both good and bad. The pandemic falls into the background. Political instability comes to the forefront. Money becomes tighter. But the world keeps moving as it tends to do. It still leaves Devin almost breathless at the idea that he'd change their lives in one weekend. While he has never really personally hated anyone to the point that he just wanted to hurt them, he does now. But that person is dead. He got the easy way out. For the first year, Devin wasn't sure how he'd continue his life. Cameron was either always sedated to the point of almost becoming unresponsive, or angry and sad to the point that he'd just sit in the bathroom and cry. The feeling of helplessness, of knowing that Cameron wanted to be dead, that he'd given up so much that he even told the bear he'd take opioids again if he could. And so Dev started doing things he didn't want to do, checking Cameron's drawers, pockets, and his side of the closet when he wasn't around. He's angry at the medical professionals who sent Cameron home because he simply had intrusive thoughts. This had relieved Cameron, though Devin was unsure. In fact, he knew it wasn't right, but Cameron was so happy and it seemed to stop the episode. But then, over the next two days, he was in a deep psychotic state. 
His intrusive thoughts were actually thought insertions, and by the time they got back to the hospital, he was screaming that he was actually dead. He accused Devin of planting speakers in the walls and cameras in the mirror, which he shattered. Over that first month, it was a normal sight to see Cameron sitting up in bed, brushing away non-existent bugs, completely unresponsive to anything Devin would say. But that's two years behind them now, and Cameron is finally starting to really live and become someone who seems to enjoy life again. Because while the positive symptoms of delusions, hallucinations, and depersonalization have been practically absent over the past year, the negative symptoms lingered. Devin had read about that over and over again. Lack of motivation, lack of interest in things that once gave pleasure, lack of expressive emotions, and moments of confusion and disorganized thought. It was the anhedonia that scared Cameron the most. It scared Devin too, because what's a life worth living if you don't want to do the things you trained and aspire to do most of your life? Despite being able to listen to music again, Cameron decided a few months back to finally hang up his guitar. Cameron's paw is still weak, and it still has a light, slight tremor to it when he holds it up. But Cameron hadn't touched his keyboard either, leaving it unplugged and dusty in their basement. The sight made Devin far more sad than it did Cameron. He still wonders if he'd been more of an advocate for Cameron, maybe pushed for further observation. It could have stopped the psychosis before it truly spiraled. Maybe he'd be his, own, his old self. What's wrong? You reading my mind again? No, I can read your face. Devin doesn't want to bring down Cameron's mood. He's the one that wanted to come out and walk in the snow. And if Cameron wants to do something engaging and active, Devin will do it with them. It is strange that they got so much of it in March, and it probably would be the last snowfall. I'm just realizing, realizing how out of shape I am. You think I'm starting to get a gut? Like, a bad one? Aren't you on the thinner side of a, for a bear nearing 30? By the way, they're both 28 now, if I'm doing my math right. Hmm. Karen makes a point of looking at Devin's midsection and prods through it, making the bear huff. Whoa, it is kind of squishy. <laughs> Devin blushes. You caught me by surprise, and you just got done saying I wasn't fat. You're not fat. You're a bear. I just didn't think I'd feel the punch through your coat. <laughs> Cameron tries again, but as expected, Devin is tensed up and there's little squishing to be had this time. <laughs> <laughs> Let's sit down. Devin brushes snow off a bench for them. Hey, I hope I'm not annoying you. Devin closes his eyes in guilt, taking a deep breath. No. I'm just worried about different things. I'm happy to be out here walking with you. It's good for the gut, anyway. Cameron rolls his eyes as they sit down. I'm getting chubbier too, you know. It happens, and I love your body. If you want to fool around tonight, I can have a closer look. <laughs> Cameron leans against Devin's shoulder. Only if I get to have a look at you too. Deal. And if we deem each other to be too chubby, 
we can go on a diet or something. Devin finds it strange that Cameron is the one usually cheering him up now. The coyote is worried about him, and Devin wishes he wouldn't be. Still, it makes him feel warm inside, and he leans in to nuzzle Cameron. Look at this little Christmas card. <laughs> As he kisses his coyote, he realizes that this is a good moment in his life. A day he'll look back on fondly. A day he'll look back on for comfort when harder days inevitably arrive. Devon glances up at the temple they're sitting across the street from. I always wondered what that golden dude with a stick is doing up there. It takes Cameron a few seconds to understand what Devin is talking about. The guy on top of Mormon temples? That's the angel Moroni, and he's holding a horn. He buried the gold plates. How do you know that? Some Mormon friends told me. <laughs> oh. Cody? The bull? Yeah. You thinking about converting? Mm, maybe if they were to come around. <laughs> <laughs> they are very gay. <laughs> Cameron leans Aww. close. Cameron leans close to Devin again. Devin smiles, and they hold each other for a while. Something's on Cameron's mind, though. But Devin knows to wait until the canine is ready. Devin, did you ever find what, what you were looking for? Devin immediately knows what Cameron's referring to, and it makes his stomach twist into knots. I only bring it up this once, but I keep thinking about why you went in the first place. I just wonder if you were able to, you know, figure stuff out. Devin stares down at Cameron, and even though the coyote isn't intentionally pointing out Devin's cascade of failures into catastrophic failure, he feels in. I figured out that doesn't matter. It isn't worth finding out. That I need to focus on us. Devin feels the sting of tears in his eyes, but forces it back. I figured out I made a huge mistake, and deeply hurt my friends. Brian hurt us. Cameron says it almost instantly. You just don't seem as happy or as outgoing as you used to. I know you're really busy with work, and you just got your master's degree, which is so cool. But you seem... In only three years? Good for you. <laughs> Actually, two and a half, because remember, he started, like, in 2021. Good for you, Dev. Must have not done a dissertation. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's like you said, we change. It's not really a divide, right? It's like chapters in our life. We change with each one, and the last one we went through was brutal. Yeah, nothing stays the same. We don't fully recover or become who we used to be. And still, we always want to go back to how it used to be. Devin feels a deep twinge in his chest, thinking about what life would be like now if he just made the right turn. It's like how they say you can never go home again. Because home isn't just a place, but it's people. And it's a certain time, and when it ends, it ends. You can never get it back. Baby, I love you so much, and I know it sounds dumb as hell, but I can be your home. I'll be around as long as you want me to be, so you can always go home. I always will. Sorry if I was sounding depressing. I honestly feel at home with you. You're the only home I've got. But you know what's weird? Mm-hmm. 
I sense a lot from that temple. And I've sensed it in other spiritual places too. Like the Buddhist shrines in Huaxa town, and even the little shops where you see mediums and psychics. It feels like they're taking in energy, and letting energy out too. Like a portal. Huh. What do you think that means? I guess that there's hope for everyone. Lapita, Artie, you and me. And maybe, instead of nothing, there's... Mm. Devin, overwhelmed with grief, happiness, love, and loss, kisses Cameron. They kiss for a long time, and Devin desperately hopes that Cameron is right, because more than anything, he wants to start fresh again and do it right. For now, though, he's here with his husband, sitting and watching the snow fall silently, and that's okay. Because whether they disappear forever or go out somewhere else, it'll be together. Devin feels a little hope reignite in his chest. There might be something. There might be nothing but he's content to wait and find out. But that will be a long ways away, he's sure. Not until they're 110, after all. Aww. They don't walk off into the sunset, guys. They walk off into the snowfall. <laughs> I will admit that moment when when Cameron says it's like there might it's like so there might be something and then um, Devin kisses him actually Thank made you. me tear up a little bit. I was like, um, let me interrupt your train of thought, like. No more, no more spooky, silly, spooky, spooky, dangerous things. Let's, let's have us. Let's yeah. be in the moment. Mm -hmm. I really like that. That's enough. That's enough. Uh, <laughs> that's enough. Um, spooky things for for a long, long time. Let's, well, let's keep it that. <laughs> and I think. Well, and I think that's coming from a place of. He had decided to give up something that was very important to him. At least give up seeking that thing that was important to him. Mm -hmm. um, but having that little bit of... That little bit of, like... Not necessarily confirmation, but evidence that there's something good there, I think was really important for Devin. And mm -hmm. just was a beautiful moment. It was like... Sorry, I'm just <laughs> kind of recovering a little bit because the ending still gets me. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think it's beautiful because the entire epilogue, we've been watching Dev desperately take care of Cameron in a beautiful, if stressful and horrific way. Mm -hmm. And then we get to watch Cameron take care of Dev. Yeah. So it's, so we, their relationship is not one-sided. And it's similar with, like, Marina and Artie from earlier as well, like, as I brought up mm. earlier, where, like, Echo feels like it's commenting about, like, all these negative things that can be in relationships, it feels very much like Arches shows what healthy relationships should look like. Mm hmm Where it's that mutual support, that caring for each other, and even during times where you're fighting or having issues, having that desire to still be with each other and to mm -hmm. have good things happen to each other. I feel like that's 
such an important thing for a relationship. Yeah, and we you're all right. We see that with Maria and Artie, right? Because Artie's like, wow, okay, Maria has um, Maria has schizophrenia. I need to take care of her. And then he has his, you know, he has to go through recovery from essentially a gunshot wound, right? Yeah, he's got and brain so now, damage from then on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, but he's still, I like that he has brain damage from then on, but he's still able to function and he has to recover. And, yeah, and like, and there's still like... <laughs> and she, and now she is helping him recover, yeah. right? And that's kind of one of the beautiful things is like, you do still see that he has some impairments from this and he's still working through that process and yeah she's supporting him through that and that's beautiful i'm also like i want them to like you know just walk by a ucc church or something because <laughs> <laughs> they are okay with quote this <laughs> yes <laughs> well i mean that's the thing is like it's fascinating and this is actually one of the things i really do love about like the writers for the echo project is it's very obvious that they can see how like people have used and branched religion as a cudgel to like be mean and horribly oppressive to a whole bunch of different people and groups but they also recognize that like religion as a whole doesn't have to be a negative thing it can be good it just depends on how you use it like they purposely yeah. made tj like the one and only really religious character in echo for a reason and also the one and only like in his route, so in everyone's route, they usually turn into the bad guy. No, 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 not in TJ TJ's route. Nope. <laughs> in TJ's route, Chase turns into the bad guy. And you're like, oh, okay. become the bad guy in his own route. Well, Chase became like, the I... bad guy, really, in Flynn's route. If anyway. Yeah, also in Flynn's route, I guess. But like, I still I, am I enjoying the image of Jenna's right route right now. Uh, TJ and and, <laughs> and Flynn. <laughs> are the only <laughs> hanging out together like yeah. where did our friends go yeah. oh yeah and don't forget that tj's having a mental breakdown right now and flynn <laughs> is out there wondering where is all my friends <laughs> <laughs> but no i i i'm glad that they did that i would have i as i said i felt like i didn't mind brian existing there was about a build and a half there where i'm like oh gosh i'm watching my characters get punched for the 50th time so kind of starting to get desensitized yeah, to that. Yeah, I really liked how it ended. The, so the, it ended in a way that was very satisfying mm -hmm. for the themes that I was appreciating about the game. Mm -hmm. That like, and so I, I enjoyed that. And I enjoyed that it did that without giving us answers, right? We still see uh, uh, Dev and Cam struggling. Mm -hmm. We still see, like, leading up to this beautiful moment we see they're both still feeling kind of like shit, <laughs> you know, right? Like, it's not like, oh, we're all happy now, but it's not. But they've made a lot of progress since they, they first started out after the event happened. They don't wave a magic wand and feel better. No. They but they also completely. aren't, but they also aren't stuck. Like, we don't close the game watching them just hate everything. Can I, can I throw out, though, like, the one thing that honestly still kind of, like, almost makes me tear up thinking about is the line of like Devin just sits there with his arm around his husband and like they kept talking yeah. about it at the beginning about like how maybe they would get married or something if he had just yeah. turned the other way it makes you like think maybe they're not gonna be together and that's why I kept asking guys do you think this is gonna end happy sad or bittersweet and like I'd say this is bittersweet but leaning towards happy I was gonna say in a weird way it's kind of just a happy ending yeah like, I was joking, I'm like, oh, sure, it will end with them walking off into the sunset. <laughs> and instead we get this romantic, like, Snow blowing seed. snow, and I'm like, that's kind you of like walking off into the sunset. No, I get it now. I, I, this is what I want to say about it. It's not bittersweet, it's realistic, but happy. Yeah. Like, I, yeah. people who use realistic to know, like, oh, it's sad, depressing, and like, oh, doom and gloom. Like, that's not realistic. Realistic is just there are good and bad and like yep yeah i i love and stories like this that showcase that both sides of the coin exist yeah like there are struggles but there's also hope mm -hmm. and happiness too and yeah that that was also sweet <laughs> <laughs> DJ's laughing at me because I'm tearing up. Aww. Uh, I completely 
understand, Hannah. The first time I played this, I know I like teared the heck up and everything. Cameron I teared up. Not as a, Hannah's I whole face is blotching red right now. <laughs> I, 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 so, radio radio description over here. Hannah's whole face is blotching red right now. Her eyes are burning red, and right now her face is facing me with arms folded, like she is going to murder me. And I have my full permission to do whatever you're planning on doing to DJ, even if it is something like kissing him to make him shut up. Murder. <laughs> <laughs> but no, you were saying Hannah. Uh, but yeah, no, kind of. Yeah, also that moment where yeah, it says yeah, sitting has next to his husband. That also, that also got got me in the feels too, and I'm like, oh. They were hinting at possibly, yeah, like like you said, they were hinting at possibly that they wouldn't end up together at the end. Yeah, this this was much better ending than I anticipated. Mm -hmm. like, I, like, I didn't expect it to go, go through uh, the, like, the stages of recovery that they did go through. Yeah, I am a little sad that Artie basically is somewhat shutting him out. No, I get that too. That's actually I, kind of what's cool. I mean, yes. It's understandable. It is understandable, but it, yeah. Again, it's bittersweet. It's a little sad. Mm -hmm. um, Artie will recover, but, and he'll have, well, not fully recover, but he'll have a good life with him and Maria, but he can never open up to Cameron again, and that feels, it, it's sad, it's kind of shitty, but it also makes some sense, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah, because they were never, they weren't, they weren't close friends to begin with. Yeah. And, and now Cameron Artie is a, Cameron is a memory of something terrifying. Well, it's not even that, it's that Artie now is like, no, I want nothing to do with the supernatural at all. And Cameron is just a beacon of the supernatural and a reminder of exactly what caused this to Artie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's too painful. I felt I was going to say something else, but yeah, that trade totally left. Was it me. about the? Uh, you also really liked the moment about like when they were looking at the church. Was it about that or? Maybe, I, I, I will say I do love the fact again. I do love the fact that like at that point, Cameron's talking about like you know I, I feel energy going in and coming out of these places, mm -hmm. and kind of putting it telling Devin these things it like it gives hope for both of them yeah it, and and I love the little joke is like oh you thinking of converting well yeah. if, they're, if they eventually be okay I'm okay with this <laughs> <laughs> I do know like something that I also liked about them pointing out that energy was coming in and out of like not just like churches and other religious locations, but also like medium shops and everything. It's just that they, we know from like the other games that there's always these places that collect this negative energy, like Echo, and that there are other places. Like it's hinted that with like the alternate reality Devin, who's gonna go hunting those places down with his ghost boyfriend and his head helping him. But mm -hmm. like, it, that's a very bleak understanding of the world, or at least a view of the world that. There's only places that collect negative energy and cause misery. Why wouldn't there be positive places? And yeah. it's kind of nice in this ending to have that confirmation that, no, there can also be these places that emit positive energy and collect it and just send it back out into the world. Well, it's kind of like when, when he was on that really bad trip, as he was about to be killed, rather than being tormented by a bunch of uh like by his mom and by those who and by like this entity that we talk about that's like you know this the sam entity or whatever mm -hmm. we'll call it it's not sam but we get what we're saying uh it's uh he was being comforted by like good entities and his mom helped him get out and so that's kind of a cool idea too that like this energy that he felt as his mom is part of what saved them yeah yeah like at the end of the day and like I'm thinking back like with Cameron's relationship with his mother and no matter like how it gets like brought up 
he never had a moment where he talked about his mom saying something bad to him or not caring about him or loving him. He mm -hmm. mentioned like they were both spiraling with drug abuse, but she still found time to constantly like get things to prevent him from dying and to make sure that he was okay, even while she was just focusing on her fan, that she mm -hmm. loved him with all of her heart as much as she could. Mm -hmm. Well, that's also generational, you know, we, we, we are only recently looking at the best ways to treat and take care of schizophrenia and other neurodivergent things, whereas from her generation, basically, a lot of people ended up having, viewing, basically, okay, either I'm going to get locked in a ward or self-medicating Yeah. through, you know, illicit and illegal drugs. Yeah, and like... We've not had the best track record of treating like any mental disorder for the longest time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's only really been within like the past century that we've been making decent progress even at doing mm -hmm. better about that. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of, a lot of themes. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, the, I guess the thing that I'm just happy about is it ends with this note of there will be harder days coming forward for Devin and Cameron, but that's also just life. Mm -hmm. They're also going to be there for each other and support each other through it. Yeah. And it's when Dev is feeling awful that Cameron makes a... And it's in an awful moment. Actually, this is also the beauty. So this last moment is really just a happy, beautiful moment. Dev himself says, this is going to be a moment he'll remember and always be happy about. But it starts with him doubting, and it starts with him be having an awful moment. It starts with him being in a low place. So the beautiful moment isn't the two of them sitting on a bench in a snow storm, which is, you know, adorably romantic. The beautiful moment is them being together and, like, the support. Also, I do love the callback to... At least until they're 110. <laughs> Which I know, like, they made, like, that joke and everything in, like, the beginning, but, like, that's something that I've been, like, taking with me now, and I've been, like, going with, like, I want people that I care about to live until you guys are 110. Like, everyone in this call, you're making it to 110. God damn it. <laughs> we'll try. Then. We'll try. So, I'll be here for, like, probably a solid 20 30 years more than y'all have been <laughs> that fame you're not allowed to do it until you're 110 <laughs> that, that, that like i i heard now that makes also, me sad because also, also how much older do you think we are than you fame you said 20 to 30 years <laughs> are we gonna look to like 130 is it okay it's okay if i ask you what your age is we're not, hopefully we're not 20 years older than you, you're gonna make me feel real old. Oh, not 20 to your, 20, 30, 10, 10 to, it would be 10 to 25. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I'll just say this, I know there's a 12 year age difference between Fane and myself. Okay, yeah, alrighty. Yes, good. Which is, which is still a little weird. Maybe no, I know, feel I know. Old over there. <laughs> I, am, I, like I, I am, I am Gen Z. I mean, I'm a millennial, so I'm actually like a tail end millennial, and I think you're either tail end or near end of uh, Gen Z. Uh, I think I'm still mid -Gen I'm, Z. I'm, I'm I'm mid Gen Z. Okay. Yeah, um, I'm early mid Gen Z. Yeah. I I had a conversation with friends last night on the on a whole thing about generations and the consumption of media, and that Gen Alpha is the first generation to actually watch, um, to place their associations and affiliate and like memories in user-based content instead of filtered broadcasted content mm -hmm. yeah. Cause yeah gen z is is weird because gen z grew up with the internet but also a lot of what we recognize as our nostalgia is coming from broadcasted tv yeah and that's kind of the opposite of millennials is we like grew up at grew up without the internet like without constant media and then we're suddenly given the internet yeah so the thing is though i'll point this out generations are kind of bullshit for like at least psychology stuff in my opinion they're more good for market mm -hmm. research 
Um, the reason why I bring that up is, like, my own family is a huge, like, monkey ranch into the generations theory. Um, yep. My stepdad was born the very last year that gets classified as Boomer. Um, my mom was born the very first year that gets classified as Gen X, and I'm born on tail end of what's typically classified as Generation Y. But what's hilarious is, like, all these, like, milestones for Generation Y. Like, oh, you remember 9-11. You uh, grew up without the internet. Like, I am very much the opposite of that. I do not recall a dang thing about 9-11. My first memory regarding that is actually getting into the third grade uh, gymnasium, er, in third grade going to the gymnasium for the first anniversary of 9-11. I don't recall 9-11 at all. And uh, well, beyond that, I actually grew up with the internet because my mom was an IT specialist, and so I've had access to computers and the internet since I was four. Uh, okay. I but, actually yeah. also didn't get to watch TV beyond Who Wants to Be a Millionaire because my mom, like, purposely wanted me to like be very like uh educationally focused I, I mentioned this before i didn't have a console until i was seven because my mom was I... very much like, the only oh don't laugh i didn't have a console until i was 13 well, hannah no well no I, that's why i was laughing is because it's like um yeah dj grew up yeah not having a console until much we didn't later have cable television until i was in high school wow yeah. So, yeah, well, you, like you have a very like skewed childhood, like I do. Then yeah, we wow. do have we did have an antenna, so we got basic. But like, uh, yeah, that's it. We we had cable. Um, we would we would upgrade to like like we'd have like video cassettes. So we I think most of like like I mean like occasionally we would like watch like certain programs on TV, but mom and dad really didn't like us watching like a lot of TV at once. Um, and so whenever I'd go to other places that have the TV on, I'm pretty sure that's why I would keep staring at the TV. Um, and, but like a lot of our media consumption was like video cassette, and then eventually when DVD became a thing, then watching DVDs and coming to a what, home theater near you. Yes. Oh, yeah. Hi. I we have like sporadic cable because my parents were like, oh now we can afford cable uh, th this time, and it's back to not being able to afford cable. Whoop. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so we had like sporadic cable. I'd have it for like some months, and then there were like big uh, stretches of times that I just didn't have cable. But we had a lot of cassettes. Uh, for like VHS and then we started getting DVDs as well um, so like that's where most of my media came from and I remember like maybe sixth grade or going into middle school is when like I actually started going on the internet because we had a computer that wasn't dying <laughs> and I could like go on YouTube without uh, like it having to load up for five billion years and then also i got like a um well i didn't it wasn't like a smartphone or anything but like i had a phone at that time as well so that's when i started getting like connected to the world outside of going to school but like my first video game console was around when i was seven i think or eight seven or eight something like that Same. and yeah Oh, and good old PS2, the, uh, and I bought stream. movie, t and I got movie tie-in games because my parents nice. didn't know much else. Oh, what's mm -hmm. up? Who who left the stream? Because there's one last thing I wanted to show you guys. Oh, I I did because whenever I click off of the stream and look at another chat, it like the screen the the, the stream just like doesn't want to load, so I I leave and come back in. Okay. So then I'll, I'll show it to you guys, though, before yeah. this, because there's one last thing okay. I want to show you guys all before mm -hmm. we actually call it for all of this. Oh. Go ahead. I'll wait until... Oh, no, I'll wait until later. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think we're ready. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Is Matt here? Matt? Do we need to roll out the, to roll out the map? No. Matholomew. Matholomew. <laughs> Matholomew. Oh, my God. Are you there, Matt? My Speak first, what us. technically Nintendo? I, I heard his. Uh, I saw his uh, voice thing go off, but I don't he might have think I away heard then. anything. So let's wait until he gets back. Okay. So, uh, technically Nintendo still calls the DS and 3D, uh, 3DS line as, and as well as the Game Boy line as a 
handheld console, so technically still a console. Yeah. Um, my first was the the uh, DSi XL um, with Wheel of Fortune as my only game for like a long time, <laughs> for like a while. Yeah. Oh. So I, I kept fucking playing Wheel of Fortune, <laughs> and I still have the cartridge. That's funny. Yeah. Um, I that was I, first. Yeah, I had a DSi when I was like nine. Now, my first console was the PS2 like two years prior, and then I got a bunch of communion money. I was like, hell yeah, I can buy my own thing. <laughs> so I bought a DSi with Lego Star Wars. <laughs> and uh, that, that was the shit. I brought it to school, I had it confiscated at school, and then I had to get it back after school. But then I, but then I never brought it to school, and I still kept playing Star Wars. <laughs> I remember when Pokemon Training Card Game was banned from my elementary. Yeah, school. <laughs> yep. I remember that too. We still occasionally have to ban it every now and then, depending on how oh, energetic yeah. our kids are. So it, we had one situation where the kids were all coming in and they were all playing it, which I was excited about. I was talking about, yeah, what's your favorite Pokemon, blah, 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 blah. And then the taking of other kids' cards, the unfair trades, the... Oh, or like one know, kid will be like, I'll trade you, Luke, you have for J uh, Jigglypuff. And then kids are like, ooh, I like Jigglypuff. Jigglypuff is cute. And then they come home. And their parents are like, why didn't you control this? And we're like, because they're freaking kids. This should so not then, be our responsibility. So, or like, they'll do it during class. And you're like, okay, sorry, guys. You lost your privilege. Mm -hmm. They did this under the board and just like slip a card under the desk. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, hey, got the good you said that as a joke, but... I mean, who knows? Confirm has happened. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I remember, I remember when... Beyblade was also banned as well. Yeah. Okay, I believe that because I will let you know whenever I played Beyblade, I somehow had a knack for like launching my Beyblades in the right way to land on the other persons and cause theirs to explode into shrapnel. Oh no! Oh, I, I, I had think... done that four different times. I don't know no, how. I... I think Bakugan got really popular at some point and then yeah. suddenly. It stopped, uh, I remember, as a child. And I was Funny like, that. I wonder where the Bakugan went. It probably was banned, but I never paid attention. <laughs> Funny enough, fun enough, I want, fun enough, I know both Bakugan and Beyblade. Beyblade was probably the one I did play a little bit because I had friends who actually had stadiums and, a, and some actual blades at the time. Mm -hmm. I've watched Bakugan, but I never played it. Mm. Oh, it's yeah. weird. Yeah, I think back when I was in grade school, Pokemon was becoming a big deal. And, like, I remember, like, a lot of the guys had Pokemon cards. And then right as I was starting to get interested in Pokemon, they were like, yeah, no, we're totally banning you guys from having the cards here. <laughs> it's like, dang it. So, <laughs> I always I feel bad about it for what's worth. <laughs> I, I actually remember in uh, my um, elementary school years when Pokemon got big because, like, I was like four or five when it like first rolled out into the US and I remember when each time like before school they had like a gymnasium where like they had the kids that came in early and they would pull out a TV and we would watch Pokemon on TV as like, as like this school and like there was like always like 50 kids gathered around this one dinky like rollout TV that they had. Dude, those rollout TVs are what made school fun. Oh my god. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, that's yeah. funny. That's funny because... In high school, this is the first time I've ever had a rollout TV recently. But it's mm -hmm. not just a CRT. It is a flat screen TV that you can roll out now. Okay. No, no ours were like. It was big, like one of those yeah, big, big old CRTs. They were like 10 inches max. I've no, I remember those. Like I remember those. <laughs> they were beautiful. The yeah, it was the like, best day when the teachers brought those in. Yeah. The, but, it would come on like yeah. the, the big old tall car and you're like, oh my god, we're watching a movie! Yeah. And the thing is, the only time I've ever seen that rollout TV was when we're watching the World Cup, um, uh, like, this past school year and during gym class and when the actual gym teacher was also watch was also yeah. doing this, wearing, <laughs> wearing the jersey. It was like, yeah. No PE this it's time. Like, it's World Cup. It's World Cup. It's yeah, World Cup. No, <laughs> my, uh, they were late enough in the day that the fifth grade teacher in my school, who loves soccer, like he 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 he, he was on the soccer trend before it was cool because it's kind of become like a pretty popular American sport now. But like you know, he was on it before it was cool, yeah. and he would literally be like, "Hey, uh, 
fifth grade, we're just gonna, you know, watch the World Cup. <laughs> and then fourth grade came in and watched with them. And I'd be like, hey, first grade, go do, do your classwork. Runs over to his classroom. What's the score? Okay, cool. Right. Uh, yeah. Okay, okay. okay. I, I do want to get us back to focusing on something related to, like, arches and everything. So, is there any, like, final thoughts about this game? Um, really enjoyed the description of relationships really enjoy the characters built um i even don't hate that brian was involved i would have liked maybe one less episode of brian i he needs to be there right like well as i said i don't feel like he needs to be there but i understand the artistic choice would have felt even better about it if we just had well i don't now, do well with torture no so i like, have a creative note that i would like to throw out regarding brian because i think you might agree with me on this one dj mm -hmm. all of brian's abuse is directed primarily towards cameron and it's so it's so strange that it's almost completely uh on cameron to the point where like by the time we're done cameron's got a chip that's been not or uh, it's got a tooth that's been chipped and knocked out he's got a broken arm burst kidney ruptured liver like mm -hmm. all of those things and Devin his physical wounds are that he got punched a few times in the fight that he actually had with Brian mm -hmm. but he doesn't have like any long lasting permanent uh, injuries he didn't get really severely hurt from anything not the way that Cameron did mm -hmm. and so like I'm not saying I want Devin to have been hurt but I do think like it would have been maybe a little bit more like Brian's an overall menace had he done more to Devin instead of it all being primarily dumped on Cameron over and over. Maybe I, I also as a it lots of torture has a tendency to desensitize me. Um so it was so as a I feel like it, it got to be a bit much whether it was to Cameron or Jet just for story arc in general. It felt like they're trying to build tension and that's why they have so much with Brian. But I felt it almost took away from what makes this game beautiful when it was just, it was like three whole episodes of like just watching our characters that's because of the way get the, the shit punched out of them, right? Once, like Once we do like the uh, playthrough with everyone else in the future, which will happen once we get through like Ocarina of Time, like then we'll, yeah, we're going to play through Ocarina of Time once we finish up Echo, once Ooh. we finish up uh, Ocarina of Time, then I'll bring in Arches for us to play as a group on Tuesdays. Because mm -hmm. this was always meant to have been like a like one-off thing, I wasn't initially planning on us doing like a full playthrough like this that we've done, but like we we realized we had like a fun like chemistry with like this small group, and I was like, yeah, let's keep going for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm glad we finished it because I, I it is I I wanted there to be a meaningful end story, and it really felt like it wasn't going to get there, and it did, and I was very pleased by that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. game <laughs> mm -hmm. i i do think that like the the three separate builds of just torture probably just more so has to do with not only the duration of time that you're invested in like seeing what happens next i think that like once you get once you go through with like a lot of it back to back to back you kind of just are immersed that you're trapped you don't you you kind of like lose sense of is there gonna be anything is is there something after this like you kind of just like what's next it's more torture um yeah because I, I think that this is also like an issue of just it being that these builds are the way they are they they're broken down and like the amount of it i think is fine it's that for us in real life we got to see okay we ended on cameron and devin being tortured two months later cameron and devin are being tortured two months later <laughs> Cameron, yeah. Cameron and Devon are things. still being tortured. Yeah, and like it, it's when it's played all as one, it's probably really risky going to be like three hours of them being tortured, which was which would be like equivalent to like what we saw with like Chase uh, or somebody else uh, in like, yeah. uh, Echo. And like it's intense, it's impactful, it hits hard. But like I'm imagining like oh, if I was playing those builds at, when they were coming out, it probably would have felt like months of this character being tortured. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that might That's be fair. it because that it did fair. it did feel like there was a point, 
there was a point where I stared at Hannah. I'm like, where did this, where did this game that I really enjoyed the beginning of go? Because I'm watching. Because again, a lot of torture will turn me off in a, in a game or a movie pretty quickly. Like even adventure movies, like, and it, it's a healthy way to to give consequences to your protagonists, right? It's a healthy way to like drive plot and make it so that this isn't just them prancing around in the woods learning about paranormal stuff, right? Like, or it's a healthy way to make it like, hey, James Bond is trying to get information, but you know, stuff happens, right? Mm-hmm. But also, it's just it's painful to watch. So when you're watching it for three sessions, you're like, oh. Gosh. Yeah. And and that's the thing is we made it like a big thing each time for us. Like you guys would have to physically come over, so like it sticks in your head more. Mm-hmm. Um, for especially like those early sessions where we had to like do this and like the fact that it like kept going for months on end. And yeah. that's also mm-hmm. why like when we did this final one and we had a four month break this time, it like hit really hard for like, oh yeah, wait a minute, there is no torture this time. There is no yeah. fighting Brian. I had, I had genuinely forgotten whether or not Brian died in Build 7 or if he died in Build 8. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and then we, and I also, another thing that I thought was really beautiful was it didn't ever answer the Lupita question, and I really like it when things, as a person that faith myself, I enjoy when media doesn't give cheap and easy answers mm-hmm. to faith and afterlife questions because to me that that cheapens what it is right that's i we you know that's what can make often like i don't know things like i don't know christian rock or whatever sometimes feel a little bit like superficial it's like that's not diving into those little bits that are hard and i think this did a good job of that and i think also um when it comes to like use of faith that's another reason i really liked um uh night in the woods The way Pastor Kate is like, I doubt things sometimes myself too. Like, I don't like it when things are just resolute, when it kind of looks at these, like, gray areas without answering questions. Oh, yeah. All right. um, I want to check with Seb and Matt. Do either of you have any thoughts regarding arches before we show, before I show you guys the last thing? Seb? Um... Sorry, my mic was my mic was strong because I just okay. Boy so you were sec. saying you were saying something, Matt. Okay, go for it. Uh, anyways, yeah. I mean, I thought the story was really good. Uh, it was very. It's definitely interesting, like seeing the state of Echo in um, when in twenty twenty. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. And I also liked how that it's, I also really respected the relationship between uh, Devin and um, Yam. Mm-hmm. Like they it actually looked like they were actually trying to make everything work despite all the like conflicts and, fall- and falling outs like they did have in the oh, story. Yeah. Instead of just camera and Alfred to sign, just like ghost him and never talk again. Mm-hmm. And then some I like this game. Okay. <laughs> like, uh, TLDR, I like this game. There's a lot about this game that just shows good stuff in what uh in like a bad situation because like even even though this shit happens to all of them they uh like may uh like art uh artie doesn't trust uh doesn't want to be around Cameron because of the whole psychic thing, but like they all get past whatever happened. Like it's still in their life, but they learn to live with it in a very healthy way. Mm-hmm. 
and this is the healthiest I've ever seen any protagonist of the Echo Project. I, yeah. You know, you're not wrong. You're really not wrong. Because there's only... Uh, I'm, without uh, things, the main ones we follow then are Sam, Chase, and Cameron slash Devin. Ch- but Chase, Leo, and um, Kudzu in Leo's round. <laughs> Have a... At the end. At the end. Hear me out. At the end, are, are a close contender, but you are completely oh, correct. This is a healthy good couple. I thought I thought uh, Seb was just saying for like a uh, healthy protagonist. Just healthy protagonist. Oh yeah, no, no, they no. Are, oh, no. <laughs> they they the are healthiest, yeah, going through whatever they ha- they have to go through in in a hectic but good manner, relatively mm-hmm. speaking. They're not. Leo and Chase uh, about this. They're very just like Jesus Christ, stuff is happening. Uh, fuck, goddamn. And then after they got get out of that situation, and they have some hardships, but they're still they still love each other, and like they know they have to get through this stuff. Otherwise, it's just it's going to get even worse if they don't get themselves out of uh, whatever hole they've fallen into. Oh yeah. I, I will say as well, like, one of the things that I personally liked about Arches is that Artie, Devin, and Cameron all felt like they made sense for why they did the things they did. There was never a point where I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? You're in a horror situation. Why are you doing that? Yeah. Like, I never felt that for any of the three of them. It felt like, okay, no, that makes sense. You're trying to protect this person. Or it makes sense. This is, like, your personal journey and arc that you're going through. While, like, mm-hmm. I look back on, like, Echo, and I love Echo, but Chase is the worst sometimes in a horror situation. <laughs> Chase is very much so a horror protagonist. Oh, it's yeah. Sam. Hiya, Sam. Hello. Hi, Sam. Uh, so we just wrapped up Arches, and we're just kind of talking about it and wrapping up on our thoughts before I show, like, the last little fun touch that happens in this game when you beat it. Um, but yeah, we were talking about Chase and how he's a terrible protagonist in some capacity. I love Chase. I love voicing him. I do think he's an interesting character. He makes some dumb decisions in certain routes. And mm-hmm. Leo's route's the one that I always think of. Where, hmm, I just got away from a sociopathic bear. And we just rescued uh, Leo. We're here with Jenna. Hmm, should I go outside by myself to pee against the side of the trailer? Or should I just pee in the fucking sink? <laughs> I'm gonna go outside by myself. Yeah. Very safe. Like, I get why they I... had to have that scene and everything to, like, get Chase captured by Brian. But my god, that's such a. Are you fucking kidding me moment? Yeah, it's like, couldn't you have, like. Was Katsu there? Like, yeah. couldn't you have. Katsu was there, and he was watching from the door. And. But the thing is, it's Brian. What's watching from the door gonna do unless you're pointing a gun in the direction? That's fair. That's fair. I, I was going to suggest Kudzu come out there with him, but I guess even then that might uh Yeah, then not you be... grab both of them. Yeah. And like yeah, like I mean that's that's its own thing. And speaking of like the protagonist, like Sam is an interesting one as well, and it's fascinating to look at Sam in the smoke room versus the thing that claims to be Sam in Echo. Like, they don't feel like the same person to me. Yeah. And we kind of get like a hint of that with Cameron. Mm-hmm. In that last part. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. And then, like, uh, I, I also wanted to throw this out there, because we were talking about, like, the alternate universes uh, type of deal. Mm-hmm. Well, while there may be two different timelines now from, like, the ending here of Arches, there is definitely, like, at least eight different timelines in Echo, at the very minimum. Yeah. And then we know for a fact, uh, because even though the Smoke Room's not done yet, there will be eight endings. There will be four good, four bad, from the very mm-hmm. minimum of what I know. Okay. And I- I'm very much looking forward to seeing how that plays out. And uh, one of the things I'm also very happy about is, now with Arches complete, two out of the three games within the Echo Project series are done, and this also means then, uh, who's making the clanking noise? 
Sorry. Oh, okay. Sorry. I was fidgeting. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, this means then that when people read the Echo Project in the future, we can have debates about what's the best way to engage with the Echo series. Mm hmm. Chrono chronologically, meaning start with the smoke room, move to Echo, end on arches. Reverse chronology, where you start on arches, go to Echo, end with the smoke room. Or release order, arches, or Echo, and then either the smoke room or arches. Yes, yeah, our introduction was basically, you were like, hey, look at this, look at this beautiful game. And like, we got the first build of arches, and we're like, wow, this is. Like, this is incredible. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm very much a proponent of, I kind of like the idea of doing reverse chronology, because it you get you get questions raised from Arches that then Echo can answer. And there's some questions in Echo that I'm almost positive are going to be answered in the smoke room. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I genuinely love that. And like, but you can also do the reverse where you like see like these things show up then later on in the later games. And oh, there's that train. <laughs> I have a train. That's me, I think. Oh no, it's, <laughs> all good. it's all good. It's kind of fitting though, because you know there's a train that ran through Echo. Yes. You like your legs? Oh god. <laughs> but yeah, genuinely, I'm very excited to see what happens when all three games are fully released to see like what's the recommended uh, play order by like the fans because my own personal one that I'm leaning towards is reverse chronology. I started with Arches first and then went back to Echo and I, I I'll say though like I technically beat Echo first before Arches but that's because Echo was fully complete by the time I started playing Arches. I got through build 2 and I loved build 2 so much so I was like oh, well, I, I need to know what happened elsewhere and it's fascinating to start from Echo is a ruined town and then go back and see Chase and his friends in 2015 knowing in five years this town's going to be a hellhole and that it's basically all done and you're, now you're playing like all of Echo wondering how does it end up like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it, it's a fascinating thing and, and genuinely I, I feel like Arches is the strongest of the three, but it's also, in my opinion, because it's the shortest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the most refined. It's... Oh. Uh, I will almost want to... Not sure. Edit is, is the best term, I guess. Yeah, it's it's gone through, like, the most... Like, Polished. Rewrites, I feel like, in, like, p polishing, editing process. And I think like it's only possible because it only has the one playthrough. There is no choices. We make no decisions. It's just this one story. Mm -hmm. But it's so worth reading the story. I, I do love the decisions in the other games, and I love like the alternate paths you can go down. But this is so strong and solid of writing, and I love it for that. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I don't know, but you guys, DJ and I, are starting to get a little... <laughs> okay. Okay, so then I'll go ahead and uh, show you guys the final little thing that we get to see. So, as you saw, we have this arch. Now let's see what happens when I continue. Huh. It's dark. Well, it's like a sunrise. Yeah, it's the dawn oh, of the new day. Sunset. No, it's the dawn of oh, the wow. new day. The day that they got to leave the mines and were able to leave. Because oh. wonder, when the game starts, it's them walking down the dusty road on the day that they arrived in Echo. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, that is so cool. Yeah, and the other thing that I kind of like is the symbology of this. In Echo, there's this talk always of you're always going in circles. You're only going in circles. And, like, it's the cyclical nature of violence and trauma. And in Arches, an arch is literally a circle that is broken. Now we know there is a beginning and there is an end. Mm -hmm. The circle doesn't go on forever. And the sun rises on a new day. We start a new chapter <clears throat> instead. 
They don't walk off into the sunset. They walk out of the sunrise. Exactly. Yeah. What I do think is also interesting is that, like, also, I mean, is there any symbolism with just the reflection of the arch and, and, the, and the logo? Um, because it's reflecting, it essentially creates that circle that you saw from uh, Echo. Echo is very much about circles, while Arches is obviously about arches. Mm-hmm. So essentially by reflecting the arch like that, you're creating an e- uh, a echo of the arch to create the circle. <clears throat> Clever. Clever. All right. Any last thoughts before we wrap this all up? All right. Well, then, for the last time here for this first playthrough of Arches, say goodbye. Bye. Bye. Bye.